The objective of this video is to introduce fractional slot windings and analyze their star of slots. So this is the first video in a sequence of videos where we introduce fractional slot windings, we analyze them, and then we talk about how to design them. And by definition, a fractional slot winding is a winding where the slots per pole per phase is fractional. So you can see I've written our definition for slots per pole per phase. That's Q, the little Q, as being the number of slots divided by two times the number of pole pairs times M. And up until now in the course, we've been talking about integral slot windings where Q was an integer. Now we're going to talk about windings where Q is fractional. And we can express this in terms of its numerator and denominator as Z divided by N. And when we do this, we reduce Z and N to the smallest possible integers. So for example, if we were to plug in our values of Q, P, and M, and we got a value of little Q of six by eight, we would reduce this down to three by four. So that as we make Z and N be co-prime with each other, we cancel out any common divisors. And so I've hinted in previous videos that fractional slot windings make our winding analysis and our winding design more complicated. So why do we use fractional slot windings? Surely it isn't because we like to have more complicated designs. And there's several reasons why we might be interested in fractional slot windings. And one reason is that we get more flexibility in selecting our number of slots or our number of pole pairs. So you can imagine that you might have a situation where somebody already has made a stator lamination and you're asked if you can use it with a rotor that has a different number of pole pairs than was originally intended. For an integral slot winding, you're pretty limited by whether you can do this or not based on maintaining Q to be an integer value. For a fractional slot winding, you've got a whole lot more options because you can let Q become fractional. And by letting Q become fractional and having more choices of capital Q and your number of pole pairs, you have more flexibility to design a winding that will have fewer harmonics in it. And the third reason is that you can develop what's called a fractional slot concentrated winding, or frequently abbreviated as FSCW, and it's also something that's referred to as a tooth coil. So a fractional slot concentrated winding, or a tooth coil, is a coil that only spans one slot. That is, it's wrapped directly around a tooth. And this is a very convenient winding when it comes to manufacturing. And if you have a coil that only spans one tooth, you can imagine that you could, for, for example, pre-wind your coils on bobbins that you directly slide onto the teeth. Or you could have a custom lamination where you wind your coils onto teeth that you then bolt onto the stator laminations. So this opens up all kinds of possibilities for how you manufacture the motor. And it also allows you to have a higher slot fill factor. You can, you can pack more coil sides into a slot if you have a fractional slot concentrated winding. So these are all positive things about using fractional slot windings. There are also a handful of problems that can come with them. The main problem is that the windings may contain subharmonics. And subharmonics can be problematic because they can lead to forces that act on your rotor in a radial direction. So they can end up creating X and Y forces that load your bearings. So you have to be careful about this when you design a fractional slot winding. So I want to launch into fractional slot windings by considering an example. Actually, I want to compare two example windings. One is a stator where we got 24 slots and eight poles, which gives and a three-phase motor, which gives us a value of one slot per pole per phase. And the second is a stator with 18 slots, and then again, eight poles and three phases. And this time, if you calculate out your slots per pole per phase, you end up having three fourths of a slot per pole per phase. And so we'll draw this out here, starting with the first winding, which is 24 slots, eight poles, three phases. And that is an integral slot winding.
And so you'll see that in this example stator, or in this example motor, I've, I've drawn our eight pole rotor. I've then drawn circles for each of the slots and I've numbered them. And I've labeled the pole span. So in this case, we've got a pole span of 45 degrees. And then I divide that up into our three phase zones per, per each pole. And so this is what we were doing for the single layer winding and also for our integral slot double layer winding when we were sketching it out on the machine cross section. And I'm doing this because I'm going to now create a graph of what our magnetic field looks like relative to each of our slots. And so if on this graph we start labeling where our slots are located as well, I've indicated slot one right here, which is right here. And when I get to the pole pair of the winding, I go this way, my pattern repeats itself again. We can say that the same magnetic conditions repeat themselves after this many slots. And it turns out that this is Q by P slots. And since the magnetic conditions just repeat themselves after one pole pair, we can consider this to be the first pole pair to be the smallest independent section of the winding, and we call this a base winding. Our total winding is composed of some integer number of base windings that we either have connected in series or in parallel, but all the base windings are completely identical. So that means that over this set of slots here, we can assign them to coil sides and have that be one independent winding, and then we reproduce that winding again over here, and again over here, and, and so on until we covered all of our pole pairs. And so for an integral slot winding, the base winding length is always Q by P slots. We can see that because there's always Q slots within each of these zones, and Q is an integer. So that means that our winding has to repeat itself after we've passed one pole pair. And that is now different for a fractional slot winding because Q is no longer an integer. Now it's going to be some fraction. And so the magnetic conditions in our slots will not re necessarily repeat themselves after a single pole pair. And so I'm gonna give you an example now where the conditions do not repeat themselves after one pole pair. And so in this winding, where we have 18 slots, that means that our slots are placed, ap are placed apart from each other by 20 degrees. And so if we label our phase zones again on here, we can then notice where our slots occur within those phase zones. And so I've placed these slots at 20 degree increments. So if we go around here, we have a slot one at zero degrees, a slot two at 20 degrees, slot three at 40 degrees, slot four at 60 degrees, five at 80 degrees, six at 100 degrees, and so on. And you'll notice that I've labeled also the angles of our phase bands. So they're in 15 degree increments. So we start at 7.5 degrees, then we have 22.5, then 37.5, then 52.5, 67.5 and 82.5 and so on. And so when we pass one pole pair, we have no slot that's lined up with the magnetic conditions that occurred in front of the first pole pair. And the first time we actually reach the same magnetic conditions is over here at slot 10. So if we were to make a graph of this, like we did for the integral slot winding, it would look something like this. where we now had to go what's called Q prime slots until the magnetic conditions repeat. And in this case, that was nine slots until our magnetic conditions repeated. So that was this entire span all the way over here before we got to a point that we had the same magnetic conditions in a coil side. And so the point from this is so that you can see there's a difference between an integral slot winding where our magnetic conditions repeat every single pole pair and a fractional slot winding where our magnetic conditions may require us to traverse multiple pole pairs before we see the same sequence of slots repeat themselves with the same phase of back EMF.
We can then take this one step further and draw the star of slots for this 18 slot for eight pole three phase motor. And so we've already calculated our spacing between slots as being 20 degrees. We can calculate our, facing, our spacing between the phasers of adjacent slots as being P times that, which is 80 degrees. So if we start drawing our star of slots, we notice that something odd happens. So we start off with slot one, and then we walked around clockwise like we usually do. And now we got here to slot five, and we can see that slot six, which is going to be 80 degrees advanced from slot five, is not going to be at the same location as any other phaser that we've already drawn. It's going to place a new entry in our start of slots, and that's going to be at negative 40 degrees. And finally, we get to the phaser for slot nine, and then we notice when we rotate 80 degrees further from this to label slot 10, it's now back at the same phaser location as slot one. And so this matches what we just set up in looking at this expression, or this, this plot up here, that once we get to slot 10, suddenly our magnetic conditions repeat themselves. So we can see that both from looking at how the slots line up to where the magnetic, the no load magnetic field flux is, where our magnetic loading is, and we can also see it from looking at our back EMF diagram. And really, this contains the same information, it's just presented in a different way. So we can finish going around here. And so what we can say is that we notice that in the fractional slot winding, our slot phasers don't always appear in the same order on the phaser diagram. What I mean by that is that in the integral slot winding, if we labeled slot one, the very next slot clockwise would have been slot two. But in this case, the very next slot counterclock or clockwise was slot six. So the phaser for slot two skipped one phaser and then appeared over here. So this is another fundamental difference from an integral slot winding. Okay, so we've gotten our hands dirty now by looking at an example winding and drawing the star of slots for it and plotting out where the magnetic field is relative to the slots. Let's now write out some analysis expressions or some expressions that will be useful for us in our analysis in subsequent videos. The first relation, or the first quantity that we are going to define is this variable t, lowercase t. And t is defined as the greatest common divisor of our number of slots and our number of pole pairs. So greatest common divisor, you can look this up in one of your old math textbooks. It is identifying the largest number that appears in all integers that are multiplied to get these two quantities. So if we say t is equal to the greatest common divisor of 18 and 4, the greatest common divisor of these is 2. And we can see that by writing out 18 as being equal to 2 times 9 and 4 as being equal to 2 times 2. So if we see that, both have 2 as one of their divisors. That's the largest divisor that is present in both of them. And if we write this out for the integral slot winding that we were talking about earlier, now we can see that the greatest common divisor is four because both have four as a divisor. In an integral slot winding like this, the greatest common divisor is always going to be the number of pole pairs. And T has a physical meaning that it is the number of layers that we see in our phasor diagram or star of slots diagram. So for our example winding of 18 slots and four poles where we drew our star of slots up here, you can see that it is two layers. That is, we have two slots assigned to each of the phasors that are in here. And we can verify that matches this expression over here. Next, we define Q prime to be our number of slots divided by T. And Q prime was this length that we labeled up here. And it has the physical meaning that it's the number of phasers that we have in one layer of our star of slots. And it's also the number of slots in a base winding.
And I'm going to say this with one caveat. In a later video, we'll talk about symmetry conditions for base windings, and you'll see that sometimes you need to have two times q prime the number of slots. And next, we'll define the quantity p prime, which is p divided by t. So it's our pole pairs divided by t. And this has a physical meaning of being the number of pole pairs in our base winding. Or sometimes you have to have two times this many, which we'll talk about later. But it also is the number of revolutions that we have to go around our star of slots before we can complete a single layer. So in our case, p prime, in our example right here, is going to be equal to 2. And <clears throat> you can see that when we were labeling our star of slots, we had, to, we had to go around it two times to fill in our first layer. Because we got out here to slot 5, and then we jumped over to slot 6, which was still in our first layer. So we didn't have a complete first layer until we had encircled the star of slots p prime times. Finally, let's denote our angle alpha z. And alpha z is the angle between adjacent phasors in our star of slots. And we can immediately see that it has to be equal to 2 pi divided by q prime. We know this because q prime is our number of phasors in one layer. So the angle between those phasors, they're always going to be equally spaced. The angle between those phasors has to be 2 pi divided by q prime. And we can then use this to rewrite our expression for alpha u. And if you recall, alpha u is the angle between adjacent slots phasors. And we define this as being 2 pi divided by q times the number of pole pairs. And so we can just, for fun, we can just rewrite this as having a t divided by t, so that would just cancel out, times p. And then we can recognize that q divided by t is equal to q prime, and p divided by t is equal to p prime. So we get 2 pi over q prime times p prime, which 2 pi over q prime is just alpha z. So in summary, this video has introduced fractional slot windings, and it's provided you the basic definition of a fractional slot winding, the fact that our slots per pole per phase is now a fraction. And it's talked a bit about why we might design with fractional slot windings and the potential drawbacks that we may encounter. We then presented an example of a fractional slot winding to show some of the peculiar differences that we now have to deal with when compared to an integral slot winding. And we talked through how you draw the star of slots diagram and differences again that appear in that. And finally, we formalized important relations and important definitions that we'll be using in subsequent videos to analyze and then design fractional slot windings.